So I had this amazing conversation with Leon. He said to me, Duncan, we've grown as a church 30%. And I went, wow. And he said, actually, last year, we baptized more people than ever in the history of our church. And I said, well, how many is that? He said, Duncan, it was one a week. It was 52 people. Mm -hmm. So we sat down and started having this conversation um, about how that happened. And it seemed to focus around the kind of principles that we talk about um, as a network. So um, Leon, give us a little bit, before I dive into those principles, mm -hmm. these five different principles that we talked about, that I, I'm so looking forward to these guys hearing about. Give us a little bit of real brief potted history about where, because your church has changed names, it's yeah. changed locations, it's yeah. grown. Give us a bit of a potted history about you and the church. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's great to see you all, guys. Thank you so much for giving up your time uh, this afternoon. Um, yeah. The church began in 1979 with um, long before my time. I was but a boy in 1979. Uh, but there was a woman that had a real passion to see a church in our community that was outward focused, you know, that was passionate, etc. And so she started it and just thinking of Peter's story there, she started in her house, group of 12 people came around, it then started to grow, went into its first building in 1981, outgrew that, came into the building that you were in here, or the kind of back block and the front block of that in 1984, 1986. Uh, and then and started to grow really from that point. I think we've always been an outward focused church in terms of our community work. Um, but I think a Sunday morning has often still been around about Christians, you know, and then when I came, I came in 92 um, as the assistant pastor took over leading in 2000. And I've always had a, a real passion. I mean, myself and Duncan, we worked together uh, in a Christian ministry over 35 years ago um, called Salt Mine. And so I've always been, I always had a heart to want to communicate the gospel to people really. And so I think for me, I love the outward focus of the church but our Sunday still was about Christians, really. It was, we were known for our worship. We were known for our teaching. And I just kind of sensed several years ago, that's great. And all of that's great. But what would it be like if we gathered around a vision of reaching people? Do you know what I mean? Not just in our community work out there, but actually seeing Sunday as part of the extension of that as well. So I think we've kind of been on this journey for a long time. And I think meeting people like Andy Stanley and North Point has given us some language and some approach we're very different stylistically than them. And that's great. That's what I love about the network as well. But I think it's just that kind of gathering around that vision. And the way I describe it, and you've probably heard this as well, in the Old Testament, there was a story in the wilderness when the, the children of Israel all in their tribes, they all camped around the tabernacle. And it's like, that's what happens in church. That There are tribes that all camp. And what they were, the tribes are trying to get into the center um and so i i look at it that like there's the worship tribe you know that music's so important we need to sing more songs on a sunday morning you've all heard that great prayer and the prophetic that's really important that needs to be at the center um social action needs to be at the center fellowship needs to be at the center and all of these different voices you will have to contend with because they'll all want to push into the center and i think what i realized several years ago is that if i just respond to all those voices we're going to get nowhere and actually, we decided many years ago that at the center of our church is Jesus, but the center of our church is Jesus's mission. And Andy put it right. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go and go and make disciples. So at the center of our church, it's not worship or prayer or the prophetic, but all those things are important. It's actually the vision and the mission. And I think for us, when we started to actually try and help people focus around that mission and be aligned around that mission, that's when we started to grow by reaching on church people. And last year, was the most people we baptized in a single year, um, which was great. And many of those were unchurched people. In fact, some of them had, the stories were amazing. They came to us via YouTube, via the website, via social media, via crisis in their life, via invitation from Christians in the church. And it was just so encouraging, really. And I think, obviously, all of that, none of that is, an, is, a, is a substitute for God's spirit, for God's presence, for prayer, all of those things are given. They're all so important. But I think for us, it was when we gathered, when we aligned everything around this vision and mission of creating a church that unchurch people want to come to. And I think the five foundations Duncan's going to talk into today, uh, they just give us some, again, some language for kind of what we were trying to do anyway, but maybe wasn't clear. And I think in the last few years, it's just become more clear to people in the church, really. So that's a little bit of a history, really. We're now, we're now one church in, in four locations. Well, five, if you include online as well. Uh, and we're experimenting with um, 
microsites, uh, which we call in little communities. So we've got one in Bromsgrove, one in Hagley, one in Cliberry, uh, which is about 45 minutes away from where we are. Um, yeah, and, and just loving the journey of that, really. But again, the heart of that is we want to create a community where unchurched people want to be a part of. And that's the kind of journey that we're on. Mate, that's so helpful. Listen, I want to take us back to something you said, because I think it's key. You said, obviously, the heart of our church is Jesus. But mm. more than that, it's Jesus and his mission. Yes. Um, and I, Because, yeah. again, most pastors you talk to, they would just yeah. say, Jesus is the center of everything. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus said, the reason I came to planet Earth was to seek and save the lost. I'm like yeah. one of those bowling balls with a, a bias on one side. Put me in a room with 100 people. I'm going to hunt out people who are far from me and lost and go into a lost eternity. Um, yeah. And and if the church was only to adopt that, it wasn't about yeah. the insiders that you walk into a room and there are outsiders that we have this bias towards them. Yeah. To do what Jesus did to be on mission with him. I love that. And and because you changed that thinking, that mindset. Yeah. Um you've seen incredible yeah. growth so we're going to talk about five foundations the five if you like steps the five principles that you've lent into which has seen your church grow um but it, are, are you telling us some principles here that we can follow are you giving us some practices what's you know is, yeah. is it a list of things to do or is it a list of ideals to gather around yeah no i think it's the principles really we talk in the network about principles practices and preferences you know and and um I, I was in a conversation, you know, I mean, last week, obviously, was here at the conference, then I went to Dublin with Andy and Sandra, so chatting to a whole load of Irish leaders, which was fun, and then I've been up in Carlisle uh, doing a weekend this last weekend, and again, talking to some of them about the network, and I re we really stress this, it's the principles that are key, your practices, your preferences, your churchmanship, even your theology around some things, are, are that's up to you, you know, but for us, it's the principles that we gather around, and I think I think what we're discovering in the network is that we're applying these principles in slightly different ways. And that's OK, because we're in different contexts, we're in different situations. But the principles work. The principles are translatable. Um, the way you do them, the way you contextualize them, that's the journey, really, um, that we all need to go on, really. And I think we, we, we've always had a, a kind of a philosophy that. We want to work it till it works in that sense. If it's the right principle, we want to just, you know, so we won't just like, oh, that's not working and ditch it. No, this is the right principle. Let's work it till it works. Let's find out different ways, you know, different adjustments. And just some of the things that we've been able to discover recently where, you know, we thought actually just that little adjustment, that little shift there, that's bringing so much life. And, and that's been really interesting. Great. So we're talking principles. We're not yes. talking about cut and paste practices. No, absolutely not. But I'm interested. I'm going to push you on some of the actual practices you have done. Yep. Because I think, you know, sharing best practices and sharing ideals yep. can help us. So let's dive in. We're talking about these five principles, these five foundational principles that when you gather around them, when yep. you, uh, I know you as a team go away once a year and you look at them and, and, and assess how we're doing on these things. Yeah. But when you orient everything you do around them, when you put budget towards them, staff time, volunteer time towards them, it produces results. And, you know, every time I talk, talk about these, Leon, at the end of it, somebody says to me, really? I mean, it's so obvious that they pay you to talk about this stuff. Really? <laughs> it's like because yeah. it's not rocket science. Yeah. But it takes the same energy that it needs to get a rocket off the ground to yeah. make keep these principles front row center in everything that we do. Yeah. So hopefully everyone's got. Um, pen and paper or uh, their phone ready to take some notes on this because uh, I think this is going to be really helpful so the first principle that we talk about in the network and I know you've adopted is this idea of being for our community yeah it, 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 explain what that means yeah for you. yeah I think th this was really helpful language to us I think we've always been a community focused church we've always done stuff in the community but I think that really subtle shift of we want to be a church for the community. So for us, I did a breakout on Tuesday. You might have been to uh, with Ali as well. We don't talk. We used to kind of want to be the best church in the community. Now we want to be the best church for the community. And that's different. It's really, really different. And so I think that means that that we do things for our community, even when there's nothing coming back. I think often churches do things with the with the I, the idea of it will help get them into church. Now, again, the balance there is that we love our community in such a way we want to serve them, but we also love them in such a way that we do want them to meet Jesus as well. So there's always a little bit of a tension there. 
but, it, but but for us it's been really liberating so when we're like going and switching the lights on i mean this year actually we're paying for the switch on the lights our town has hit real financial difficulties and so we went to them and it's going to cost us 10 grand and that's okay that we're going to invest that you know we don't want them we don't necessarily need the community to know that but we just we know that we we're for our community that's not going to necessarily bring anyone into our church but that's okay when as we've adopted this kind of principle being for our community we're looking for opportunities that we can serve we're looking opportunities that we can be involved we're looking opportunities that we could like our young people went and um, uh, uh, cleared up the litter and painted the park benches uh, in our community over the weekend you know community groups were sharing social media about our church doing that that wasn't us doing it there was the community was saying it when they know you're for them actually they become for you as well you know, and so we are finding people coming into church more now, um, but it's not because we're kind of saying we're only going to do something if you come in. We're actually trying to presence ourselves more in our community. I mean, Mehmet, who's a friend of mine, who, who's a Turkish guy, he's a Muslim. He, he owns the Grill, which is a restaurant right by the church. And when there was the um, uh, earthquake in Turkey and Syria, I went in there so much, you know, and and I prayed for him. He asked me to pray for him. We raised money for them. They were blown away. Do you know what I mean? They says, you're all Christians and, and you're doing this for us. He was blown away, you know, and actually we'd become friends, you know, and, and you know, and, and there's just some of that sense about being for the community, I think is really important. And then it gives you those opportunities. We build bridges over which Jesus can walk. But the reality is that the disconnect between church and our culture is maybe as wide as it's ever been. And we've got to find ways to build bridges over which Jesus can walk. And I think for us, the more we've become for the community, for the community, actually the community is kind of more for us as well, really. So, so that's, that's the first principle. What that looks like practically for us, classic things like food bank, um, uh, you know, other things, we have a furniture project. So I think last year we had about 80 families that have received free furniture from us and so we find people in need and then we just like take them furniture you know donate it and blah 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 but also other things like your warm welcome spaces we also use our building a lot uh, so a lot of community uh, groups use our building that gives us opportunity we're, we're a blood donation center so there's often people lying out in the auditorium having blood taken out of their arms there's quite a lot of blood spills so that's a little bit of an interesting cleanup job before Sunday but again people people have come to church on the back of that you know I had a lady that she she came to give blood uh, and then she watched us online as well uh, after that and then started coming you know and so it was through the giving of her blood that she that she kind of came really you know um, so again all of these opportunities and again context is everything you you might not be in a context where you can do that find opportunities to be for your community and your community will become for you as well and eventually ultimately I think for Jesus as well. And, and we ask these questions that Andy, Andy asks these questions, Andy Stanley, does your community know you're there? Are they glad you're there? And are they better off because you're there? And that's really quite challenging to us. You know, do they even know we're here? Are they glad that we're here? And are they better off because we're here? And that takes a long time, a long time. That, that Those questions are, are so yeah, they're great. A Andy said to me that they when they first came across those questions they asked that does that community around north point does it know we exist yeah. so andy's one of the fastest growing churches on the planet um they have uh, they have you know six or seven thousand will turn up on a sunday morning to that one campus and they have eight campuses around the city um so andy commissioned an outside agency to do a survey within a mile radius of their church. Mm. And they asked one question to all the residents within a mile of the church. And the one question was, do you know North Point Community Church exists? And it was 80, I can't remember what you said now, it was 87% of people said, never heard of it. Mm. They didn't even know. I mean, if you're gonna reach yeah. the community, yeah. they have gotta know you exist. Yeah. So yeah. doing blood drives yeah. and yeah. Uh, furniture yeah. banks and, Yep. Christmas light switch ons. And, and yep. I tell you what, before we move on, um, here's because uh, listening to you talk for some of us, you know, um, Pete was saying he was from a kind of smaller startup church. Mm. For some of us, the thought of all those things feels a long way down the line. They feel yep. here's one thing you can do, which doesn't cost you any money and actually really works. I've talked to so many people who have adopted this and it works. One of the ways you can tell whether a church is for its community or not is by looking at its social media page. You, know, you look at someone's Facebook page or Instagram page or Twitter page or X as it is now, 
And it's all if it's all about the worship leader and the pastor and what happens on a Sunday, the community look at that and say, oh, they're just about themselves. Mm. But why don't you adopt the idea that says for every one post we make about the church, we make one post about the community. We congratulate this, the high school for winning the football cup. Uh, we 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 go down to the new bakery that's opened in town and have a croissant yeah. and a coffee and tell everybody about yeah. it. Um, yeah, we yeah. Uh, talk to, talk about the council's new project here or whatever it might be. We we big up the local community and then, like you say, they start leaning into that. Oh, yeah. the church has reposted our yeah. our new bakery being opened. That's yeah, really yeah. cool. You really can good. be for the community and it won't cost you anything. Just follow and comment on everybody yeah. else's in your community, everybody else's yeah. thing. That'll prove yeah. that you're for them. Because yeah, you like yeah. you like what they do and you yeah. repost what they do and you're for what they do. Yeah. And that's a simple, easy way of beginning to to, yeah, to yeah. let them know you're there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. brilliant. So some of those people then that you in those organizations or businesses are influencers within your community. Yes. You know, so all of a sudden they like you and they'll speak well of you. Do you know what I mean? And that that can be a really helpful, um, you know, kind of benefit of that as well. I think it's really the good. First principle, Leon, if we're going to grow yeah. a church that unchurched people love is genuinely yeah. it's it's looking out there and saying like jesus was for the lost and for the yeah. hurt for the broken we need we need to be for them and that means they know we exist they're glad we exist and actually they're better off yeah you know the park benches get painted the litter yeah. gets up. they're better off because we exist yeah. brilliant i love yeah. that second principle my friend that we often talk about is creating radical jesus followers mm. and i think covid showed us that actually we thought we were doing quite well on discipling yeah. Christians, but they weren't as radical as we thought they were because COVID yeah. hit and they ran. Yeah. So what are you doing to grow radical? Because the closer you get to Jesus, the more you realize he is on a mission. Yeah. You know, it's not just about growing fat Christians who know yeah. all the worship songs. It's yeah. about growing Christians who are broken, like he's broken for the lost. So how, yeah. how have you changed what you're doing discipleship wise? Yeah. I mean, th to be honest, th this is the, this is the big one, really. I think most church leaders would say this is the out of the five that we've got principles. This is the big one, really, in terms of grappling with. I think it's a worldwide issue, especially in the Western church around discipleship. I mean, some of the things are around, again, not looking. I think we talk a lot about think about steps, not programs, you know, because we all have different programs. But actually, where are these? If you think of steps, steps are taking you somewhere. What are, what are we what are we? What are we looking at? You know, Jesus said, go into all the world. Didn't say go and make converts, said go and make disciples. Yeah. You know, what does a disciple look like? You know, I, I like the John Mark Comer language to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus and to do what Jesus does. Love I it. think that's really simple. And we're we're trying to gravitate. Actually, that's what that's what someone who's a Jesus follower is. They want to be with him. They want to become like him and they want to do what he does then the reality is or the hard work is what does that look like you know and i think some of the things we're learning is that the quicker people can get involved in mission actually the better the disciple they are i think often we think about discipleship is it right now they're, they're not you know, they were a, a non-christian now they're a christian now we need to get them to become a deep christian the more we can put them back into mission because they're the ones that often got um, uh, a mission field right there they've got friendships and relationships and so what a friend of mine called Steve, who got baptized two years ago, really unchurched guy. He's he's been work, work he's been on Alpha. He's baptizing his first, the guy that he's brought through uh, in a few in three weeks' time. So it'll be two years to the day that he got baptized. He's baptizing another young fella. You know, well, he's grown in his discipleship, not just because he's learned a lot of things about God, but because he's in the mission. So I say that's one of the things that we're learning. And I think the other thing then is to think about all of this stuff. I think reality is we all do as churches we try to do too much uh, and so we you know and this is I'm, this is not wrong if you've got it that's fine you know we have a men's ministry a women's ministry we have prayer groups we have singles groups we have this this, this. we have so much and I, I think what we do then is we just burn out on programs so i think for me it's thinking about in the whole discipleship piece what do we want someone to look like what is a disciple what's the end goal and then what are some of the steps that can help people get there it's, it's not a full answer because it's a really, really uh, difficult um, one to do. And I think we're experimenting at the moment. We're, we're reviewing all of our group systems, you know, why do groups exist? Um, we're looking at the way we use resources like Right Now Media that we get through the network. That's been really good. So a lot of our groups are, are doing those kind of courses. And again, we're very much in the philosophy of deep and wide, not either or, but both and. How do we stay wide? 
okay, and outreach focus, but how do we help our people to go deep in their relationship with Jesus, be with him, become like him and do what he does. Um, and again, everything that we do that's a program, rather than think about it as a program that's disconnected, are they steps on a journey, almost kind of a pathway? So we're developing kind of ideas around people pathway and all of that kind of stuff. Mate, you, you, you might think you're struggling with it, but what you've dropped here is brand new thinking for many church leaders mm. because discipleship has been about a program. It's yeah. about knowledge. It's about, yeah. can you get through the Bible? Can yeah. you, uh, can you um, answer those kind of questions? And, and to the realization that the, the sooner you get people on mission, the more on fire yeah. they are yeah. for Jesus, yeah. the yeah. more you get someone on mission and someone says, how do you explain yeah. suffering yeah. then? The more someone yeah. says, I need to lean into God and figure this out. That's right. That's right. So, they'll start uh, reading their Bible more. They'll start praying more. Do you know what I mean? When they're doing stuff, they'll ask other people stuff, get relationships going. Absolutely right. In my experience, churches that don't have radical disciples like that are mm. where people sit around complaining that the drums are too loud. Yeah. It's too dark in the sanctuary or the service isn't long enough or the preacher's not deep enough. And, yeah. And they're secondary things compared to help me win my lost friends for Jesus. Yeah brilliant yeah. radical discipleship so the first two principles being for the community yeah. and creating radical Je jesus followers which means you're on mission with him so if you like those first two are really mission focused they're really yes. out there focused that's right aren't they that's right the next three because if you're out there and you're doing good in your community and you're being a radical jesus followers to your neighbors and your sports mates and your work colleagues yeah. and the mums you meet at the school gate um if you're out there doing that you, the first thing they're going to say is uh, so what's your church like can I come with you to church or you might want to yeah. be able to say to them come come with me to church sit with me in church you want your church to be no people in your church to, to be not further than seven days away every week from a mm. credible invite to an event that's going to point them towards Jesus yes yeah. so the third principle is creating what we've described as a come and experience culture so you're yeah. out there you're making a difference and you you want to be able to give an invite to say come with me on Sunday yeah. Yeah. And you create these common experience cultures. Unpack that. How have you done that at Life Central? Yeah, it's great. I mean, get, let me give you a story. If you were at my breakout, I gave this story, but it's actually gone on a week now. So uh, beginning of May, I was, me and my wife checked out the, the new coffee shop just up, just up the road, in a little village just up the road. And we, sat, we sat outside, it was nice weather. I was there with my sister. We were just catching up and waitress came and she she sat on, on, on the chair by us and she said, you're Leon from Life Central Church, aren't you? And I, she actually called it Zion because that's the, that's what we used to be called back in the day. We changed that name. Um, and she, I said, yeah, she used to come to a youth group that we used to run. She's in her like 20s, I guess, late 20s, early 30s now. Had an amazing conversation about faith. Uh, and she said, can I come to church? She said, what do I have to do to come to church? Like, do I have to book in or whatever? Really on church. I said, hey, come, you'd be really, really welcome. Uh, I had confidence to invite her where before years ago i'd have said oh yeah why don't you come uh next month when we've got this special event why don't you come when we've got this do you know what i mean when we've got this guest service because we used to do that and there's nothing wrong with that but now we're in a situation where every sunday is an invite opportunity anyway she came uh the last sunday in may with her partner who didn't want to come but he came and their two twin boys they came last sunday and then the sunday just the sunday after that the second and then last sunday just gone he couldn't come and the boys couldn't come, but she came. She's been three out of the last three Sundays. I reckon she's our most regular attender, to be honest, over the last three Sundays, because nobody else is that regular. But I think for me, um, having a Sunday where you can invite somebody any Sunday, no matter what the theme is, you know, no matter what subject is, knowing that they're going to understand it, they're going to feel welcome, and that hopefully they're going to want to come back. Um, is really, really good. And I think for us, it's been a shift away from special Sundays where we're thinking about outsiders to we're thinking every single Sunday. So we use the language that Andy brought to the conference last week, assume they're in the room. And that's probably been one of the biggest statements that shaped our church. Assume, And I was at a church, like I say, over the weekend, and some of, some of them came to the conference and they were commenting on that. And they said, and when I spoke at that church, they said, the way you said that is really different you know, the way you acknowledge people who might be there for the first time, the way you unpack that bit about the Bible, the way you didn't assume that everybody knew the story of Daniel, you know, or Moses or whatever. Just those little things where you're conveying to someone who's who's a guest, who's there for the first time, 
we know you're here and we're glad you're here and and we want we want to help you on this journey so i think some of those kind of things again is a massive it's a massive uh, conversation really i was talking to one of Sorry, yeah. I was talking to somebody at the conference who who said, I love that assume they're in the room. And yeah. he said to me, we're going to start doing it when we start having visitors. And I said, no, 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 no. Do it now, even though you haven't got visitors, because it'll yeah. give your people confidence yeah. to invite their friends. They've, they'll know if they invite, if I invite my friends, they won't, uh, they won't speak churchy language. They won't yeah. speak insider language. Yeah. They'll actually speak the kind of language that my friends, so they, they'll start inviting. And he went, I've never thought of that. Yeah. And I think it's also... You speak to who you want to be there and who yes. you see being there, not necessarily who is there. Good. And it is hard. When, when we did started doing it, you know, the whole, we call it like the, you know, the flight attendant bit that we do at the start of every service. Hey, you're going to be with us for 65 minutes. If you need the toilets, blah, 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 blah all of that stuff. When we started doing it first and people were like, we're doing, you know, like we all know where the toilets are, but, but we're speaking not to those who are there specifically. We're speaking to those who we want to be there. And who we see like almost prophetically will be there, you know, and if you keep doing that, then eventually they will be there. They really will. One, uh, one more question on this before we move on to the last two of these five principles. Um, what would you say is your win for a Sunday morning when you're putting the service together, when you're thinking about the, yeah. the, the sermon, when you're talking to your teams, the worship yeah. leader, the guest services people, the welcome teams, the, the kids teams, the, the youth teams? What would you say is a win for a Sunday? Yeah, we, I mean, we've, we've had different language for this. Um, I think we're probably looking at reshaping the language a bit. It's going to be around uh, our kind of goal, our win for a Sunday is to create such an experience that everybody who comes, wherever they are on the faith journey, will have an encounter and will want to take their next step of faith. Love that. You know, so it's, it's, it's really, it's not just about the unchurched because we're not, we're not a church for unchurched people. Yeah. That's really important. We're a church of church people that want to reach the unchurched. Yeah. And that might seem like semantics, but it's really important. We do what every other church does. We have baptism. We have communion. Do you know what I mean? We, we talk about, we sing, we, we, we pray. We do everything that every church does. Church of church people that want to reach unchurched people. So it's a very subtle, but it's really important. But I think our win is that everybody who comes has an encounter with God and wants that leads them to want to take their next step on their faith journey. So for an unchurched person like my friend Jen from the coffee shop, I wanted to come back. Now she's been three weeks now, which is great, but do you know what I mean? So she's come back. So that's a win. So for me, that's a win. You know, somebody might come and give their life to Jesus, like my friend Steve. He came for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and he just kept coming back. And then one Sunday, he gave his life to Jesus. But but, but the win wasn't just that. The win was that he came back. You know what I mean? That he wanted he had an encounter in such a way that that he wanted to come back, and in that that was really important. In terms of the gifts of the spirit, Pete's asking that question. Obviously, as an Elim church, and Pete's in an Elim church as well. You know, obviously that that's an issue we we want to work through and do work through. For us, for some time now, the actual overt gifts of the spirit have been much more deployed and used in small groups. It's been difficult in a bigger setting like we are now uh, for that anyway. But we, we're very open in the sense that w we, we say that it would be really sad and tragic if people came to church looking for God and all they met was us. Yeah. So we know it's not just about three songs and a really polished talk. It's an encounter with God. So for us, the way we use the funnel kind of approach that Andy talked about. But towards the end, where we would be different from Andy is that we will create some space um, and, and what that can look like is a response. It can look like a song. It can look like quiet and stillness. Sometimes we have people that have said, hey, I feel God is saying something and, and we'll, we'll put them on the stage and they'll share that. It's great. Encounter's great. But for us, it's encounter with explanation. So whatever happens with the gifts of the spirit, it's encounter with explanation. And I think that's really, really important. But things like speaking in tongues and all of that, you know, we're a Pentecostal church. And so that I believe in that. I do that every day of my life. But the Sunday morning isn't where we see a lot of that, partly because of the size and partly because of the emphasis. But we have a midweek. We've got a midweek tonight, actually, where we'll be a lot more um, open in that sense and a lot more focused. Although even in our midweek, which we assume we, we've always assumed is for insiders, we see more and more people who are not yet Christians coming there as well. So that's great. So we would do all that. But like I say, encounter with explanation, I think, is the key.
encounter with an explanation. I love that. So first principle is being for your community. Yeah. Second principle is creating radical Jesus followers who are on mission with him. The third principle is when you do that, people are going to want to come to church. Yeah. <laughs> and therefore you create an experience where they come and they experience, they encounter God. But there's a level of an explanation that goes with it. And you're assuming unchurched people are in the room. Love that. The, the fourth of these five principles is um, prioritizing mm. the next generation. Mm. Um, and I know that's important to you guys. Why yeah. is prioritizing family ministry? Why yeah. is prioritizing what you do with the under fives and the fives to 11s yeah, yeah. and the teenagers and the, and the, you know, the, the young adults, why is prioritizing yeah, yeah. that important for the growth of life central yeah. and how does, pro what does prioritizing yeah. look like for you? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of reasons why it's important. The number one for me is a missional. It's that actually mo many people come to faith in Jesus under the age of 18. I think it's under the age of 13 statistically. Um, and so actually, in terms of a mission field of helping people, our mission is helping people find and follow Jesus. If you're not prioritizing the next generation, you're missing the, the biggest part of the mission field. So for us, pr primarily, it's that. I think also, though, within that, it, it, it's a great way of reaching families, a great way of reaching adults. You know, most adults in our community are good people, aren't they? They want the best for their kids. They're trying their best. You know, um, in fact, this 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 couple that I was telling you about who came their their twin boys love being in kids work. And they said to me the first week, this is like free kids work for an hour on a Sunday morning. I said and that because they're on a journey. And hey, if that's what it takes to help them go on a journey. Brilliant. But 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 you know that if you take your kids to somewhere and they don't you don't feel it's safe. You don't feel that they really know, people know what they're doing. You're not going back. Doesn't matter how great the worship is and the music, doesn't matter how great the communication is, if you don't feel your kids are safe and are gonna be and are valued and they want to people want them to be there, you're not going back. So for us, prioritizing next generation is is putting ever such a lot of resource into that. In fact, when 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 we were in Atlanta um at North Point, we we some of us went to a, a next gen conference with Orange, which is one of our partner organizations, they produce the best material around the world for, for kids and, and for young people. And I, I sat there thinking, oh, we're doing all right on, on youth and young adults. You know, we've got like a couple of hundred youth and young adults. We're doing all right. I really felt God convict me saying, what would it look like if you double down on what you were doing with, with kids and youth work? That even though it's a strength of yours, what would it look like missionally if you went, if you, you didn't just say, okay, that's okay. Now we'll go on to this, that's weak. And this, you know, actually if you double down on your strength and I feel challenged by that and we're having some conversation about what that could look like. But I think typically it, it's, it's about where you put your budget. It's about where you put some of your best people as well. Um, it, it's about how you, how you kind of look at everything you're doing um, through the eyes of that. I often say, even when I'm, when I'm communicating, can a 15, 16 year old teenager understand what i'm saying because the reality is if they can't a lot of unchurched people won't neither you know and so i think a lot of that is so we would have our 14 plus in every sunday um so we we do youth work from 11 to 14 on a sunday but our 14 pluses are in to be honest with you many of them are serving 80 percent of our teenagers are serving our production team wouldn't happen without our teenagers I mean, sometimes I come on a Sunday and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I feel so old. I want to give everyone on team a glass of milk. That's how young they look. Do you know what I mean? And, and, it, and it's brilliant. And these guys at 14, 15 are serving Jesus. They're praying. You know, they're, they're learning what it is to be on mission. Many of them are inviting their own friends now as well because they're invested. I think when our teenagers are invested and they're not just, you know, fed, but they're actually invested and they're contributing and they start inviting their friends as well. So I think in, investing in the next generation is absolutely vital. I know that in smaller churches, it's so difficult and I understand that. And I think even within Elim, um, the, the denomination I'm in, we're talking at the moment, how do we work together? And I think as a network, you know, we really want to support uh, churches and, and, and resourcing each other, one another. And, and that's so important. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I've often thought, um, kids you know mum and dad drag their kids to school five yeah. days a week wouldn't it be just so amazing if on the weekend if on a sunday the kids are dragging mum and dad to church because they they've turned up once or twice they've been invited and it is so amazing yeah they say mum and dad i don't want to go to granny's this weekend 
I don't want to go to the beach this weekend. I want to go to church. My friends are there. It's so much fun. I know Andy, I mean, you and I were in, um, in Atlanta, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And <laughs> when you walk around their kids ministry areas, I mean, it's like going around Disneyland. I mean, yeah, they've yeah. got a Disneyland budget, so we can't replicate that. I get yeah. that. Yeah. Andy says to the people that he meets in the community, the, the, the gens that he meets having coffee. Yeah. Yeah. He often says, he says, I, I tell them, don't bring your kids to my church. And they go, what do you mean? He said, because if you do, they're going to want to come every Sunday and you're going to have to bring them. Don't, and, yeah. and it's, it's true. They come and they go, this is amazing. Whether they're toddlers or whether they're teenagers, there's something so sticky about that. And yeah. part of the way that North Point has grown, part of the way your church has grown it, um, is investing in that younger generation because yeah. they bring their parents. Yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant. Okay. Absolutely. So that's the fourth of the five principles being for your community, create radical disciples so that there are, you know, not just programs, but there are next clear next steps in everything that you do. Create, come and see Sunday morning experience. Mm. Prioritize the next generation. And just, just on that, on that prioritizing the next generation. I've been doing this for 20 years. Every time I'm in front of a group of church leaders and I'm teaching them about church, I always say to people, can you put your hand up? And I won't do it now, but it, can you put your hand up if you became a Christian? Oh, look, balloons. Put your hand up if you became a Christian. Um yeah uh, in your before before the age of 20 in your yeah. kid or teenage years and it's always 85 90 percent of the of the audience that put their hands yeah. up and i always think if that's the case if that's if we were a business and that was the area we were getting most traction we would put most resource towards that yeah. why are we not putting 80 or 90 percent of our budget yeah. and our time and our effort towards that if that's yielding the best results um i think it's i think this day and age with our culture the way it is um it's more important than ever to invest in that generation Absolutely. tell us a little about uh, you know I, again talking to church leaders and i think some of the people that are with us today one of the questions i often get asked is yeah but how do you find really good materials what do you use that that, that doesn't burden your kids and youth yeah. workers i mean kemi's just asking that question and kemi i'm asking one of the guys if they'll post a link to orange orange is the partner organization that we as a network work with it's american some of the videos you know we had that whole pushback oh they're american voices and all of that the reality is most of your kids are listening to american voices every single week honestly they know what they know what a shopping mall is yeah they do they do they know what a sneaker is yeah, they really do i might not do but they do um, and the reality is it's the best material in the world that we found and we've used a lot of different material as well and i think what, what it what it does is um it enables our practitioners our, our youth and kids staff and volunteers maybe they're all volunteers that's we have lots of volunteers that, that teach our kids it enables them to focus on 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 loving the kids caring the kids building relationships with the kids they don't have to spend their time putting loads of stuff together now they don't they, we, they have to look at it they have to contextualize it they have to do a little bit of work with it but it's such a massive help um, and I, I mean, we, we've got the resources where our guys could write the material, you know, but they say, no, please don't let us go back to those days because we are so much more effective, you know, when we can take the material, contextualize it a bit, make it us, leave some bits out, add a few bits in, but we've got the bare bones and it's really good. The other thing is that we put all the videos out on YouTube and I know my granddaughter watches it all. Do you know what I mean? And, and I brought a Ollie the Owl thing from Atlanta, which she sees every week on, you know, she's four. She sees ev every week um, th this kind of little owl thing on the TV. It's just all that kind of stuff, really. It's so, so good. So that's some of the resourcing uh, things. And, and Chris has just put in there, Kemi, Think Orange. You can have a little look there. But the network, we have ministry area coaches um, one of those is Ivan at Andover Community Church. And again, uh, our guys, Sam uh, and Harvey, our, our kids and youth guys, part of the great thing about being a network is that we want to help each other. Yeah. So often our guys will talk to other people in the network. Hey, what are you doing with this? You know, how, how do you handle holiday clubs? How do you handle, you know, when you go away for weekends, you know, all that kind of stuff? How, you know, what, what have you found that, learned, that that works well coming up to Christmas? And all of that kind of sharing of ideas and resources is really, really good. That's great. That's really good. Thank you. Final one. Yes. Um, uh, and again, it's going back to this idea of being on mission. Yep. Um, how do you gain, train and retain volunteers? Yeah. yeah. If you ask yeah. any church leader these days, they'll say, I just, we haven't got enough people. 
how do you get new volunteers keep them retain them and yeah. train them up because it's you know it it's such an important thing because if i came to your church leon i would yeah, yeah. like i've just done i would call it your church you yeah. know until i yeah. put on one of those t-shirts that you have for a sunday yeah. morning and start then all of a sudden it becomes my church yeah and you you turn yeah. consumers into yeah. co-owners yeah through volunteerism yeah. they are own yeah. the mission that you own yeah. so volunteerism is so important um, serving yeah. is so important but it's uh, it's an eternal battle for church leaders i i can't get enough people i don't yeah. know how to train yeah. them yeah. and if i get them for a couple of weeks they've gone and i can't retain them so how do you yeah. gain train and retain volunteers I, I i think there's a shift that we have to make in our in our heads and hearts as leaders i mean even in the language that we use about gaining training and retaining volunteers it kind of falls short a little bit because it can make it feel very transactional like i want you to do something for me the big shift I made in is just, I made this shift when it came to giving like financially, like years ago, is that I don't want something from you more than I want something for you. And, and so I want to speak about giving and stewardship, not just because I want money from you, but because actually this is a discipleship thing. And it's the same when it comes to serving and volunteering. It's not that I want something from you. I want something for you. In terms of discipleship, I don't think you can have a fully formed disciple who's not serving, who's not giving. Do you know what I mean? I just think that they're, they're they're part of what it is to be like Jesus and do what Jesus does. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. So I think for me, it's a, it's a shift in my head and in our heart to say, actually, I want to find a place for you to serve because I want something for you, not just I want something from you. I think that's really important. And that's not just semantics and it's not manipulation. It, it, it can be, but it shouldn't be. And I think that's really important. And I think then, then structurally and what one of the things we've done in the last few years, I have to say it's one of the things that I think is the best thing we've done in the last few years. And, and this is not to do with me. I initiate the idea, but I have not had anything to, this is all Andy Hancock, one of our staff here. I came back from America a few years ago with and thinking we're struggling with this whole area of serving. And, and what it looked like was that everybody was trying to find people to serve in their area. So I need you in the kids team. I need you in the worship team. I need you in the production team. And it was a bit of a smash and a grab, really. And then somebody half decent comes through your church. Do you know what I mean? And all the ministry leaders are, you know, on top of it, really. <laughs> um, and actually, there's a church that in America, it's not North Point, but they, they run a thing called the Dream Team. And, um, and I came back and talked about the philosophy behind this. And all of our guys hated it just because of the title. That's so American, you know, the dream team. So I said, well, let's think of a better title. Uh, and we couldn't. So we went with the dream team. Been the best thing we have done ever in terms of this. What does so that look like? When, when you join the dream team, you don't join the worship team or the production team or the kids team. You join the dream team. So basically, rather than your kind of group being up here, it's, hey, you're joining the team that's helping to make this dream become reality. So what that's done is it's given cohesion. It's meant that we've got like systems and structures. So we ask people to sign up for a year. We do a little review process. How are they doing? Do you know what I mean? So that because we want to communicate, we're for you. We're not just want something from you. We have a dream team party every year, which is one of the highlights of our year, where we just have a lot of fun. Do you know what I mean? And we 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 tell we we just we just celebrate. You know, we we give awards out, some fun awards. You know whatever you know just all kinds of stuff honor people tell stories this is why you do what you do and then everybody feels they're part of the mission everybody feels they're part of the church and then out of that dream team you find your tribe you find your space and then so when i stop like i'm a musician when they tell me i'm too old which they did several years ago so i'm no longer playing now i might be out the worship team but I'm, i've not left the dream team i'm still in the i'm still in the team help me find somewhere else to serve and it's been, honestly, it's been the best thing that we've done. So a few Sundays ago, I wasn't here. I was out speaking somewhere else. They did a Dream Team Sunday, cast vision for it. At the end of the service, there was like, hey, go and check out where you could serve. I mean, the guys signed up 50 people to join the Dream Team that Sunday, which is phenomenal. That would have taken us like six months. Do you know what I mean? Of, oh, we're short in kids' work. Anyone help us? Oh, we're short in worship. We've changed all that. We don't do any of that now. We used to. We don't do any of that. We, we say, this is important for you. And, it, and and hey, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you can serve as well. We've got people who aren't Christians who are serving on the dream team. We just find the right space for them. But when they sign up for the dream team, that, that, that it's almost like this. That's a step. 
and then the growth that comes in them is absolutely huge so that that's one of the things that we do and we willingly share any of that with anybody we're learning it's early days but so it's been it's been absolutely brilliant so so you've now got 50 more people in your church who've moved people, from, yeah you've moved from being consumers yeah just turn up bring their kids and yeah. consume whatever you deliver yeah. to them. yeah to co-owners yeah yeah saying, I, I, saw, I saw on face saw on facebook another day this fella saying i'm really excited he's a brand new christian i'm excited it's my first time on car park do you know what i mean and he, he's really excited you know and he's like again it's that sense of identity and belonging people want people want connection people want community yeah. they want to feel that we used to say to everyone if you want to find community join a group we probably now would say join the dream team yeah groups are important and we're trying to figure that out but we probably are shifting a little bit we think people are going to find community more when they're in the dream team and they're doing something yeah. you know than sat around talking about the bible important though that is so we're just trying to figure that whole shift out really Leon, it's been brilliant. Five principles being for your community, creating radical Jesus followers that are not just getting fat Christians, but they're on a mission. Um, creating a common experience culture so you're never more than seven days away from a credible invite to an, for an yep. unchurched person. Um, prioritize that next generation and uh, gain, train and retain volunteers. And when you, those are the principles you've gathered around for years now. They're the principles we teach in this network. And because you've done it, You've grown. You've grown, yeah. which is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, can, can one other, if anybody's got, we've got about five minutes. Anybody's got another question, but either unmute yourself or check, stick it in the chat. But Pam's asked a question, which I think is, a, again, a question lots of leaders ask. Uh, and it's this, Leon. Um, I get what you're saying. How do I get everyone on board? Because for <laughs> many church leaders, it feels like they go to drive or they come yeah. to yeah. the conference at your church, the Further Faster Conference. Yeah. They hear Andy talk and they get it but they can't get everyone else to get it. So it's, it's yeah. a bit like the start of a race and there are 10 people lined up and yeah, so the yeah. gun goes off and everyone runs in a different direction yeah. and it's chaos. Yeah. And it feels like that in church, the gun goes off and everyone says, no, Sundays are about worship. No, Sundays are about teaching. No, Sundays yeah. are about community. No, Sundays are about evangelism. And we're all pulling in different directions. We're not, and if we pulled in the same direction, it would be phenomenal. We'd see 30% yeah. growth. We'd see 52 yeah. baptisms a year, but we're all pulling yeah. in different... How do you get yeah. everybody, elders, yeah. staff, yeah. volunteers, how do you get them all pulling in the same direction? Yeah. And what do you do when someone wants to pull you off course? It's a great question. And it's really hard. <laughs> I think you've got to give it time. It, it takes some time. And I think for me, you know, I, I use the same phrase. I think Andy used as well about concentric circles is key. So who, who's in that tight center circle? You know, whether it's your elders, your leaders, staff, whoever, and then think concentric circles. Who are who are then your next circle of leaders and influencers, and then maybe your members. And if you're thinking concentric circles, and try and try and cast the vision, it's the why behind everything. You know, so if I just say, "Oh, we're going to do a thing called the Dream Team," it's like, oh, but you have to talk about the why behind it, and that has to play out first in your um, circles, in your smallest circle, and then moving out there. And I think as you move out further into the circles, you don't need as much detail, but you, but you need the relationship and the detail in, the, in those smaller, tighter circles. Every time I've tried to bring any kind of change outside of that process, it's never worked well. But, but and again, it's not a, it's not a fail state. You know, it's not a guarantee, but it is a guarantee. If you don't do that, it won't work. Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got to work with that smaller circle, then the next circle, then the next circle, however you define that. And I just think the more stories you can tell, Yes. You know, the more stories you can tell, the better. And you, you celebrate, you know, what, what gets celebrated gets replicated, you know, so you thank people. Hey, hey, so-and-so did this. And when they did that, that's modeling this value that we have as a church. When you celebrate that, then that gets replicated. It gets rewarded, you know, in that sense. And I think that's really good. I've and, seen and I think that. modeling it yourself, modeling it yourself as well is really important, mm -hmm. you know. Really I've important. seen you do that. I've seen you on a Sunday morning when I've watched you. I've either been in your church or seen you online. You, you know when someone gets baptized or someone tells yeah. their testimony you stop before you push on and you say listen if you give money to this church yeah or if you serve in area in any area of this church yeah, yeah. you're part of this person's story that's right. that's part right. of the reason why they've got to the place they've got to is because you that's were on right. car park duty and you that's made right. sure people could park properly and that's so, right so so you do that a brilliant job bringing people but that's the way to bring alignment bringing yeah. people back to why we do what we do sunday by yeah. sunday Absolutely. listen our, our time is through um 
thank you. This has been so, so helpful, so rich. Feels like we've just scratched the surface, but it's been great. I am so glad you have dropped your email address in the chat. That's very kind of you. Yeah, if anyone wants to follow up conversation, please drop me a line. Love that. We'd love that as well. So I'm going to ask you to do one more thing in our time we through. We represent so many different churches from all around the country um, here right now. Would you take a moment just to pray for us and our church? Yeah. We, we've, we've bitten something at this conference. We've caught a bit of a virus. Yeah. And like Pam says, we've got to go back and align everybody behind it now. So can you pray that? Yeah, God would love that. Would love that. Yeah, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for just the joy of spending an hour together. And just, Lord, the the technology that enables us to do this is amazing. God, I pray for these people. And uh, Father, every one of them is in a church, in a community somewhere. The answer to their community is not my church. It's not our church. It's not Andy Stanley's church. It's them. Yeah. And it's the church that, that they're in right now. And God, I pray that they would know your presence. I pray they'd know encouragement. Lord, I know that they'll be facing challenges like I am and like we all are. But God, I really pray that, that Lord, that there would be even something in this hour that has just caused them to mm -hmm. just to kind of want to go on another step and to take another risk and to, to go again another week. And just to believe that, God, you are a God who said you'd build your church and you you meant what you said. So, Jesus, I just want to pray over every single church, over every single community. We pray for all those people who, who maybe don't know the church that's in the, that, that these guys represent. They're out there, but they're people that you lived and died for. God, there will come a day when many of them uh, will come in and they will experience you, be baptized. And maybe, God, we can think back to conversations like this that started something that results in someone finding and following you. It makes it all worth it. So God bless them, I pray. Give them a great day and a great week and an amazing weekend in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks, Amen. man.